morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'd like to first thank the organizers for bringing me in over from Switzerland. It's, um, it's, a, it's an honor to be here in the, one of the leading institutions in nanotechnology, and I'd like to thank uh, our hosts, uh, Rick and Wade, for their gracious hospitality, and especially the delicious dinner we had last night. Uh, Bill uh, Beckenbauf mentioned that he has a special relation with uh, Rice being a graduate. And my Texan wife, she got a PhD here in physical chemistry. And actually, uh, listening to Rick's lectures when he was still coming on a motorbike to give classes here. And so I have a soft spot. It's the first time I'm here at Rice, but I have a soft spot in my heart for this particular university. So the, uh, the uh, lecture will be uh, dealing with the uh, nano meso mesoscopic solar cells. One particular configuration is the disensitized cell. And so let me start off just show you how beautiful Lausanne, Switzerland is. This is our institute here, Lake of Geneva, Alps, lots of opportunities for skiing and outdoor. So, uh, I could convince Carol to stay in Switzerland, uh, changing the scenario, this very beautiful university here. This, uh, just to uh, acknowledge my coworkers, we're working on, we are very dedicated to the work on solar cells. And so we are covering all the, the aspects, film technology, dye research, PV cell testing, electrochemical research, the fundamental research in electron transfer, and here are some of the uh, funding agencies that support our research. I'd like to mention particularly the Air Force. Uh, Mike Dostock is here, and the uh, Air Force has been uh, very generous to us to so support our work in this field. This is Rick's uh, slide. I always show it uh, when I give lectures. It's uh, just to remind us what priorities we have to face. And uh, just a couple of slides that uh, actually come now from Europe. Growth in photovoltaics, I think we all believe it's going to be strong. Uh, it's just one figure I'd like to mention. It also comes out of RWE shot. Uh, 300 gigawatt, per, uh, gigawatt peak, and that's 200 billion euros business. That's more than this whole semiconductor business today. So it's, it's a growing market, and there's room for many players, so we don't have to quarrel. Photovoltaic people don't have to quarrel. We're all friends, and there's a lot of opportunities. So uh, this is uh, just what, what Winfried, he, he is kind enough to give me this slide. And you can see that by the end, for this uh, year 2030, you have uh, crystalline silicon, but thin film and new concepts given high priority, and and Hoffman thinks that really we need more passion and excitement in this uh, photovoltaic uh, field to get the, con the, the, the clients, the consumer interested. So color flexibility, lightweight, ease of integration. And for all of that, we need new technologies. And, and we're talking today about some of these new technologies and, and their relation to nanotechnology. So I said lots of excitement. You always hear new things popping up. One, I just saw that article when I was riding the metro in uh, the subway in London this summer, and they, they give you a free journal to read while you're on the subway. I saw that. Gosh, can laptops are not spinach? And then I, f I found this article. So, well, it's done. I mean, people have used uh, just uh, the photosynthetic reaction and two electrodes and give some conversion, albeit a very small efficiency. Some other toothpaste generating uh, electric power. This is more related to what I'm going to tell you. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's uh, the new concepts pop popping up. It's an exciting time. And uh, as I said, we have, to, we have to enlarge our horizon. We have to, to bring in new uh, technologies that would provide a cheap and uh, large-scale production opportunities. But let's not forget the, uh, the rules of the game. So uh, what, uh, if you have a single converter, 
you it's about 900 nanometers, you want to pick up all the light below 900. That's for a single charge converter. And that light you would like to transform entirely into electric uh, current and get a reasonable voltage and fill factor. That's, the whole th that's what the game is about. And so when you produce electric current, well, we have to absorb the light. I just mentioned a 900 nanometer gap would be just ideal. You have to produce the, the charge separation and then collect your charge carriers. And uh, so that gives you the current. You have to have a good voltage, flow factor. They usually these cells are measured at, at 25 degrees centigrade under what, one AM, one AM minus 1.5, which means the path length is at 1.5 that the sun would be just vertically uh, uh, on top of your head. So uh, uh, yesterday we actually, there's some diffuse light. There was a question from uh, the gentleman from NASA, how much diffuse light? Yes, there's about 25% diffuse part in this uh, AM 1.5, and uh, this, these are important. Uh, I'll come back to that later. You can pick up uh, another 50% by just albedo effects from reflection, and desert, clouds, snow. But uh, one thing is also true. These standards have been set by the silicon people. And uh, the silicon people cool their cells when they, they just flash the light on it and so that uh, they don't warm up. <laughs> and so we have to realize that these the efficiency game, efficiency numbers that are being quoted, it's a standard, it's like a thermodynamic standard state, but it, it's not really the realistic uh, condition. Uh, outside you, you have a temperature rise of the cell, usually up to 60 degrees, and for every degree, silicon loses half a percent. And so you're talking about the significant loss just by the heating effect. And so these efficiency figures, they're just there to compare, but uh, what the client really wants to know, and I'm getting emails all the time from potential clients, they want to know at the end of the day how much kilowatt hours they get from one square meter per year at a certain exposure. And so they must be careful to uh, overstate a case when you do measurements low temperature and the, the cell is heated. Also, a lot of mistakes being made by uh, using the wrong simulator. You have to be careful. The, uh, this, uh, some of the lamps don't reflect at all what uh, the sun looks like. Just last lecture, we heard about this 8% cell and discussion at the end, hydrogen production at 8%. Well, that happened to be a light source that had a lot of UV photons. And, and so these 8% are not at all related to solar conversion efficiency. So what you can do is you just uh, integrate your spectral response, the, the incident photon current conversion efficiency, over the solar emission, and that uh, will give you your short circuit current. So you can always check when you measure then, is that the same current you measure with your, with your solar cell? If so, you, you can be reasonably sure that the simulator is working well. So now, let's go back. This is all the, the organic solar cells. It's where we start. Uh, the uh, first organic solar cell was uh, actually published by Dr. Tang. I, I just visited him at Kodak. He's, uh, he had this idea of making a flat junction. And uh, Nate already told us the problem with a flat junction is uh, that the absorption length is typically uh, much longer than the exciton diffusion length. So you don't produce enough charge carriers. The, uh, the light is absorbed, you make excitons, but they don't make it to the junction. They recombine before they reach the, the junction. And so that has been a problem. There have been hundreds of millions of dollars put into concepts like that flat junction, just trying to mimic the silicon photovoltaics, but that didn't work. And so a lot of people got disgruntled and uh, thought, well, the organic solar cell is never going to work. It was just the wrong concept, as we will see later. We ourselves, just when uh, Tang published his uh, paper, we had we started on our disensitization. Actually, this is this is our first disensitized solar cell. As Dr. Kazmierski uh, showed us the first silicon cell, right? <laughs> this cell was actually uh, 
exposed in a department store in Lausanne. The manager came one day and said, uh, well, what are you doing? Tell us, you know, get all this money from, uh, from public funds. Uh, what's, what's coming back? What are you guys uh, doing research? Uh, I have an open day to show us. I said, well, I just started working on solar cells. And so he said, well, why don't you just put it up? And you can see the, uh, this was the, uh, the film. It was a tit titanium uh, sheet with some, some oxide on top. And we had, uh, we had maybe often the surface just some soil gel method, so the, the light collection was enhanced by this enhanced surface area. And then you can see the platinum wire mesh current electrode. This was a bromine solution, bromide in water. And, and you also see I'm showing the voltage. The reason why I'm not showing the current is because I would have to steal the solution. <laughs> and so that would, the steel would have used a much more electric power than what I was producing in the cell. And so I, I thought, well, I better show the voltage. But we were very worried about this experiment. And uh, that's, you'll see how we, where we are today. That's about 15 years ago. I think Nate will remember the time when we were funded by the Gosford Research Institute. And uh, the, the, in these days, we were working on those rough electrodes uh, using disensitization. And the disensitization, you don't have the problem of uh, exciton diffusion length, simply because, uh, in this case, your dye is right at the junction between the electron conductor, which says Ti to any other electron conductor, and the uh, hole conductor, which could be an electrolyte, organic hole conductor, ionic liquid, you name it. So the, the light absorption is done right at the spot where you, you want it to happen. And so dye absorbs light, injects an electron in the conduction band of the oxide and a hole, hopefully, in the other phase. The only problem you're facing if you do that is that on a flat surface, we, we can't absorb any light with a monolayer. And so if you put many monolayers on top of each other, the, um, the outer layer will just filter the light. So that's not a good strategy. In addition, you would need to dope those, uh, for example, the uh, semiconductor that conducts the electrons would have to be doped. Otherwise, the insulator, so you don't get the electron through. And so there is some quenching going on, so reduction of yield. This whole concept was actually at the time when we started, people had, had left that. So it's, it's not, not at all promising. There's some notorious problems that can be solved. But then comes the change in paradigm. And the change in paradigm is the interplanetary network, network junction solar cell. And so that's what you do now is uh, exactly what uh, Nate said in his lecture. You're now separating absorption lengths from, uh, from the carrier diffusion lengths to the interface. So collection length and absorption length are not the same anymore. And so the, uh, the, uh, the dye is now on a nanoparticle of uh, titanium oxide. It's, I'm showing here one of those uh, ruthenium dyes we're using. And in the normal uh, kind of the old uh, classical configuration, we would use that particular ruthenium dye that would inject electrons in the particles. The electrons migrate, through, per percolate through this uh, nanoparticulate film. And so now you have to regenerate the dye. You do that by electron donation. So you have a, you have a, a iodide, electrolyte, or ionic liquid, or polymer electrolyte or hole conductor. So that would replenish the electron you lost. And then uh, you just need to shuttle those uh, triiodide species to the opposite electrode, and you're getting a cyclic system that converts light to electric power. Very similar to what Bill mentioned yesterday, the interpenetrating networks are our cousins, where the, we have the fullerene and the, uh, the polymer as hole conductors. It's actually something the physicist would have never believed in uh, this experiment. Uh, only a dumb chemist can think about such an experiment. The physicists believe in flat junction. And they say, oh, disorder, oh gosh, recombination, you'll never get anywhere. And so here's a completely disordered, nano disordered system that, as I will show you in a minute, gives very high conversion efficiencies. 
So let's just see the, the, the just oppose that uh, one experiment where you do you use a single crystal, say a TI to annotate single crystal over one surface, and now you cover that surface with a with a dye. That's actually the doping process. You have to dope it so it becomes conducting, and then uh, you cover it with a dye, and you see it's a very miserable uh, response. You get only a fraction of a percent of the photons converted in electric current. So that's not something you can oppose to to the silicon solar cell system. So from an academic point of view, very nice, but conversion efficiency, way too low. Now we go to nanocrystals. And just to remind you that in this case, we have the uh, sensitizer now as a monolayer it's spread out on this whole surface. And suppose you inject an electron here, it would have to make it percolate through all these nanoparticles about 20 nanometer size TI2 particles, uh, going through hundreds, about 200 particles, to make it to the collector. And despite of this long diffusion length, uh, the collection and uh, the conversion of uh, photons to current is uh, almost quantitative in a spectral range where you absorb the light. That's over 80% conversion efficiency. So here we are going from our, uh, going, we're going from our $50,000, because I had to make the single crystal to pay a technician for half a year, uh, $50,000 single crystal to, uh, to our, I don't know, uh, five cent nanocrystals. And, uh, and you get, oops, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. And you get this huge increase in um, efficiency. It's, uh, it's a factor of 10,000 more in current, simply over the or solar, you get milliamps currents, 10 to 20 milliamps with those films with that particular sensitizer. And so how does that work? Well, I don't want to go too much into the scientific details here, but uh, we have that network. It's, uh, it's insulating, so the sensitized uh, the sensor injects electrons that turn the particles from an insulin conducting state. You have, uh, the, uh, uh, you have the crafting. It is very important to have a self-assembly of the sensitizer so that it spreads out on the surface. You have the right anchoring groups. And you need about 10 micron thick to get the surface roughness of 1,000. So that helps you to, to, to harvest the, the solar light. Here's a, a picture from my New Zealand uh, newspaper. This is David Kahn from Weizmann Institute and Jim McQuillan from Otago University, and see they had made their own little cell here. It looks like a colored glass, but it's actually producing power. You see the fan turning. The fan turning on light that comes from all angles. That's one of the advantages of this cell. It, it, it collects light from all spatial angles. You come from the back, get same, roughly the same efficiency as from the front. When you mount a cell like that in a building, a window, or a facade, you will get a much better efficiency in the terms of um, light harvesting than you use silicon because the angle of dependence of uh, the uh, light harvesting is, is much, much weaker than conventional solar cells that have just one surface being active. So we have a bifacial cell. Bifacial cell, as I said, hundreds of nanoparticles between these. I just show two layers here. Of course, the light comes from all angles, and uh, as I said, sensitizer injects electrons percolating through this film, being collected, and then you have to have something in the pores that would conduct the positive charges to the other charge collector. And again, the, the nano dimension, very critical. So it's, this is a cell that needs nanoparticles, simply because we, we, we need the huge surface enhancement. And we have to have that feature I mentioned to you, that the injected electron, you go from insulated to conducting. Then we have to screen that charge. All of that requires a nano dimension. So it's a, a genuine nanotechnology. Uh, so the uh, nanotechnology-enabled uh, system. And as I said, the uh, 
real amazing thing is when you generate these electrons, they, uh, there's no field. I mean, they don't know where to go first. They would unnecessarily visit some particles out there and then perhaps go back and finally they, they, get, they get collected. But uh, despite of this random walk, it's a random walk, the electrons do, leisurely visiting all sorts of particles, finally coming back. We can collect all these charge carriers. The, the, the reason being that the diffusion length of our electrons is the order of 30 microns. And as I mentioned to you, we need only 20 microns to absorb the light. So here we are in a situation where the fusion length is now larger than the light absorption length. And that's when you gain. That's why we get these high conversion efficiencies. Uh, so uh, a lot of kinetic work has been done on uh, how these systems uh, work. But uh, i just give you a summary. Injection reaction from the excited state, very rapid to femtosecond reaction. Regeneration, also very fast, nanosecond to picoseconds. And then you have these slow events. The electron has to hop from trap to trap, so they're going leisurely across that film. But the recombination is even more slow, and that's why we're getting these long carrier diffusion lengths. And so it's to have one charge curve that it will percolate in one phase, and the other in the, in the whole conductor phase, electrolyte. And so the trick is these two charge carriers and they're separated by an interface. And here's your way to control things. The dye itself is an insulator in the ground state. And so if you make a nicely assembled monolayer, that dye will actually block the electron from recombining with the hole. And so in a way, the, the, the dye is a, it's like a photodiode. It injects the electron but blocks the, the electrons from coming out. And so we'll see later, we have done a lot of work on uh, perfecting the uh, self-assembly of the dye. And our cells now have, a, we have gained voltage from that because every time you prevent a back reaction, you gain voltage. And we are now at 860 millivolts with our standard cell, and cell efficiency over 11% in a single cell configuration, over 12% in our first tandem cell configuration. So we can also play with the color. You can. Uh, this is a black dye, it goes up to 900. Would be nice to have a response, as I said, that would go up straight. I show you later a cell like that. We, we, we achieved it with a tandem con configuration. It would be nice to have that from a single dye. But what's the onset at 900 is fine, but you would like this to go on very steeply and then collect all the photons. But anyway, collection, if you are in the plateau, you get over 90, 80, 90 percent. That's uh, not counting the losses, a reflection in a glass. If you put under reflect coating, it will get more. So it's just plain glass, no correction for losses by reflection absorption in the glass. I mentioned color. Now, a lot of people uh, out there, I'm talking to VW at the moment. They, they like to have roofs for their cars. And uh, they say, well, for heaven's sake, give us a colored roof. We don't like red because people look pale in the red car. So give us green or blue. <laughs> and so color matters. Color matters when you're out there trying to sell your photovoltaic cells. Here's a green cell made from this particular porphyrin that uh, we developed with David Officer from SA University. This is a module that chart. Uh, develop. You see all the colors. You just can get a yellow, green, you name it. And uh, Dr. Hoffman tells me that uh, for him, it actually it doesn't matter how efficient this cell is. If it's 5%, he's happy. He doesn't want to have below 5 So the hunt for efficiency is one thing, but aesthetics, building integration, satisfying the client, make him happy, make him passionate about your solar cell. This is another matter, and I think Konaka is uh, has hired the right person. They have a good manager who, 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 who understands how to address these issues. Uh, so uh, these are now the state-of-the-art uh, nanometer uh, nanocrystals. We are making ourselves by some, um, so by some uh, 
hydrothermal method. Uh, they are one-on-one -on -one oriented faceted particles. This is the size distribution. And we usually add some scattering particles that would enhance the optical length in the red. So we can also harvest the, uh, the red edge of the uh, absorption. You see, this is how it's sensitized. You see how it decays, it's just solution spectrum. A miserable response. Look at this 700 nanometer uh, feature, of very little absorption. But I use this sensitizer. I can still, with the optical tricks, the scatter particles, despite of the very weak absorption at this wavelength, I get 50% conversion of light to, to current at this particular wavelength. So optics can do a lot for you. It's called light management. It's something well known in, in alpha silicon technology. And so I mentioned to you the 11% reached by optimizing the voltage cutting down of the recombination so our cells now have uh, about 17 milliamps, this particular cell, 860 millivolts VOC. What we can do better, we can, uh, this is now a first tandem configuration where we have a two absorber system. We cover this uh, whole visible now, 24 milliamps current, and over 12 percent. And so this, certainly with a tandem concept, it's an easy way to move the efficiencies up these are by no means optimized systems. Stability is a major, a major concern and issue. And so a lot of work has been done to test whether these cells can hold out, whether they survive in the rough conditions outside. Now, there's two standard tests that people usually carry out. UV plus heat, 1,000 hours. And then this, this has been the toughest to meet, the 85 degree test. Hours. The, for, for the, for to, the photonic stability has always been very good. I mean, people have, have uh, run things over 14,000 hours or even longer in full light, and the sensitizer just cycles. Very, very stable. What has been more of a problem has been the, the, the containment of the electrolyte. So we have been uh, able very recently to meet the uh, 85 condition, two things we, we did. We, we used self-assembled monolayers. We went to hydrophobic dyes because water is an issue. And you don't want your cells to be water sensitive because there always will be some water in those cells. So we took a defensive uh, step and we, we, we used those uh, hydrophobic tails and coed solvents. And that has brought a remarkable and amazing stabilization so we're just building up a phalanx on the surface to reject any <laughs> interference in, the, uh, in these, these redox events. And lo and behold, we could then meet this very harsh test at 85,000 hours, no decline in efficiency. Uh, so many, many tests have been done. And uh, I, I can only assure you that the, uh, the minimum lifetime of these cells can now be, from an industrial point of view, can now be wanted for at least 10 years. And so that's, uh, that doesn't mean they, they will be going broke in 10 years. It just means that we have now enough material to say, in 10 years, nothing will, be, will happen. So um, let me talk a little bit about the advantages. As I said, we're all friends, but there are several differences. So <laughs> we have to bring those differences out. Of course, cost, ease of production. Bill mentioned the, uh, this uh, roll to roll. This is critical to get up the volume up to use these production technologies. The, uh, the uh, TI2 can be applied as a paste. It can be screen printed. So uh, this is, of course, much easier than uh, uh, cutting uh, wafers. The, uh, well, the increased temperature, I've mentioned, is something in the competition. We have to be very honest and tell the client that your, the cell that behaves at 60 degrees, not always the same way as, as at 25 degrees. Bifacial, I mentioned, I mentioned the angle, I mentioned transparency, color. That's the figure for silicon, which comes out of our Paul Scherer Institute. Five gigajoule per square meter, that's invested energy. But 
in Geneva, it, I don't know how somebody mentioned one year, but it takes 15 years in Geneva to get that back because we can do the back, off, back on the envelope calculation. You get about 1,200 kilowatt hours solar per square meter per year. And that's what it would give us in payback time. And so for the Dyson size device, it was much shorter, about 300 times less energy content. So uh, some pioneering uh, products, pilot line, some are out for field tests. Konarka has taken a lead in the uh, flexible thin film plastic solar cells. So Bill already has talked about this. I move on to some other configuration embodiments. Well, what I feel is uh, we, yesterday we discussed the uh, very high systems cost balance of systems. And so a lot of applications could be done, just take away all this balance of system. Think about uh, hybrid vehicles could be run on just charge up your car while you're standing in a parking lot and drive with the electric power that the sun gave you while you're working. And so that's a lot of people just go back and forth a few miles every day. So that would take a lot of uh, saving, but bring a lot of saving and fuel consumption. So I feel that uh, concepts, decentralized concepts are very important. And especially I like the hybrid vehicle as a one approach where these technologies could certainly fare very, very well. I mentioned the colors. These are now transparent uh, cells. One company called Great Cell. This is uh, taken in, uh, in Copenhagen. You can see, you can look through and the uh, various degrees of transparency. This is now in uh, South Korea, Etri. Some uh, power windows they, they researchers have produced there. You can look across, see the cars. Again, transparency. But these cells, these, these uh, windows can produce power. And it brings me back to the point I, I, I mentioned yesterday. I think one has to really think about building integration. You know, things are, the whole uh, cost calculation is much more favorable. If you can make your solar cell part of the building, replace some of the building elements by elements that uh, will produce solar power. And so windows, why not use windows? A lot of windows have the red tinge anyway, I've seen here in Texas. And if you don't like red, well, take yellow or green or blue and you use those other colors. Here's some of our licenses. We have an industrial license, Konark as one. We have Japan, Aisin Seiki, Toyota. They've made those uh, modules. Uh, Hitachi, this is Soloronics in Switzerland, this uh, spin-off from our own uh, laboratory. Some activity in China. Here's my favorite one, the, this in South Africa. I just got that through the internet. Uh, this uh, group that had made their, they have never had any contact with us. They just have picked from the literature the uh, instructions. I mean, they're not perfect, those cells, if you compare them to the <laughs> modules before. But see this big, big clock they have, and it seems to be driven by those cells. And uh, I think in, the, in, in South Africa, there's a lot of, in those countries, there's a lot of opportunities. You see, uh, I, was, I was in South Africa last year, and there's, uh, many villages have no electrification. And so there's a real need to, to help the people and uh, uh, produce on the spot the solar cells, not import expensive modules that are paid by the World Bank, but no, make the things happen in these countries and assemble those cells in these countries. So excitement and passion, <laughs> that's what we need. This is actually the first, uh, this is from a uh, STA, uh, Australian, uh, first uh, solar wall in uh, Newcastle, Australia, where these uh, cells are now being field tested. It's a CSIRO building. So I will finish uh, because uh, we have uh, five more minutes uh, to talk to you a little bit about storage and the hydrogen to come back to Nate's talk. Nate was kind enough to refer to our cells. I said I would <laughs> say a little bit more about the uh, importance of nanotechnology in 
the area of uh, water cleavage. And so we're working on a tandem cell with a, a group that uh, is, uh, with Professor Augustinsky and Carl uh, Zaffer in Bern, Delft University, but there's also a company involved. Uh, this company was set up in 1998 in, in, in London. It's called so High Edition Solar Production Company. And so Nate already showed you the idea it originally was to split water this way while the valence band reaction makes, makes oxygen and conduction band hydrogen. But it's not easy to do that because the band gap problem that Nate mentioned, so only very few oxides are colored. Two are by W3 and iron oxide. And so uh, iron oxide has a very bad reputation. <laughs> So, it's, so uh, I thought we would take it on as a challenge because uh, the carrier lifetime is very short in iron, iron oxide. But remember what, uh, what Nate and what I, I told you. If you have, if you have nanoparticles, the, uh, the fusion length of the carrier, minority carrier, has, has to be only a few nanometers because we'll make it to the interface. And if the interfacial reaction is fast, you will get them out despite of the fact that you have very poor uh, materials. And so the mesoscopic dimension is extremely helpful to enlarge our uh, possibilities in selecting oxides for water oxidation. And so uh, the tandem then would look this way. You would make oxygen from the, it's like Nate show, the oxide would make the oxygen. And the dye cell behind would just be a bias, just increase the chemical potential of the electron. It has to sustain the current that comes out of this first cell. That's all it has to do. And it, it will provide additional chemical potential to make hydrogen from, from water. Because the oxide that absorbs in the visible does not make you hydrogen. The valence band is much too low. You, you're lacking about a half a volt. So you have to provide that extra energy. And that's the role of the second cell, the bottom cell. And the nice thing is that bottom cell is driven by light that makes it through the first cell, so you get this for free. And that's exactly the concept. So the first cell makes oxygen, and then the red light will go through. It's passed through this. Uh, the electrons are passed through this cell, which is just a, a bias, and can get the hydrogen going. And so as I said to you, the nanocrystalline oxides are very important in this sense that you have possibility to, uh, to work with materials that have short carrier diffusion length. And uh, it's just a, a, a cartoon of such an oxide electrode. WO3 has done very well. Uh, the, uh, some uh, nano, this is a nano, this is a nano crystalline electrode of WO3. You see the short dimension here. This is very, very important that you have this short dimension so the carrier can make it to the interface before they, they combine. The one dimension has to be a mesoscopic in the nanometer range. And so at, with the W3, we are now at um, 5 milliamps per square centimeter. In, this is a true AM 1.5, I say 4 to 5 milliamps. That's Professor Augustinsky's result. I think it's trustworthy. He has showed me the experiment. And if you combine that with the dye cell, you have a 7%, 6 to 7% overall conversion efficiency. Now, this just shows you the, the, ox, the iron oxide is more of a challenge. Wouldn't it be nice to have a water electrolyzer based on rust? And so uh, that's the ultimate uh, anode material. Uh, actually, the rust doesn't look all that bad if you, you make use this alter. Uh, all, this, all this ultrasonic spray deposition. You see again, you get these leaflets and look at the dimensions. You have a 50 nanometer feature in these leaflets. And that's what helps you to collect the carriers before they recombine. And so we still have a long way to go with iron oxide. Uh, I, I, but we haven't been making progress. We are, we are, I've shown you now one polarization curve where at the potential where we can run, that is, uh, that's what the back electrode would provide. You get about 1.5 milliamps, and that's about 2% efficiency. Not bad for rust as a collector electrode. But we still have a way to go to match the twice or three times higher cons that W3 give. 
And so um, here's a tandem cell that would do the decomposition. Light in, first the double D, nanocrystal oxide, the dye cell behind, and it's a simple combination. It's really a simple con concept, but I thought I would bring it out to this audience because it does use nanotechnology. And if we hadn't had this uh, mesoscopic dimension of our oxide particles, we would go nowhere with iron oxide. We'd get nanoamps current. And so it helps to structure the electrode to go to nano dimension. And that's what I wanted to show in this last exa example. So with that, uh, I would like to finish my talk and thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> Questions? Uh, I have three comments. Uh, the first one is about the environmental accelerated tests. Uh, just to remind the audience that the accelerated tests were designed for crystalline cells with the interconnections. Hence, uh, there'll be some learning curve to try to understand what are the accelerated tests needed for such cells. We have learned when we went from single crystal to polycrystal to amorphous silicon and thin films that the failure mechanism were not the same. Just a comment, and hopefully there'll be some research spent there to understand what are the, the real failure mechanism. They might not be the same as was what developed under the different IEC uh, regimes. Well, can I answer this? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, of course, we yeah. want to first we need make to sure that, yeah. your cell doesn't degrade yeah. when you go to the module. But as I told you, there's now field tests being carried out. This is an industrial. The scientists, uh, we have done our job. Mm -hmm. If we give them a cell, the, fo the folks that make the modules, they can't ask us to do a technology optimization. It's sure, we, have, we need good interconnects, but this has been taken care of. This is not a problem. It is, as you could see, the tiles have uh, interconnect it's, tiles. It, it's and not so, just interconnects. It's everything. I'm just uh, well, yeah, you bringing don't want the to, attention. You, you don't want your contacts to rust. I understand that. But this is not the intrinsic. We're talking about the intrinsic stability of a photoconversion system. This has been established. The intrinsic, it can last. It doesn't degrade if you put light on it. That's, that's, that's great. You stand back here. Yeah, sure. My, my, my comment is, is still yes. there to try Absolutely. to get, to get the better yes. understanding Absolutely. so that we don't get into surprises in the future. You're and right, but you see, things I, I, are out in the field, so people I, I, try I'm that. Glad, I'm glad to see that. Uh, the second comment is about the, the 15 years that you talked about for uh, replenishing, replenishing the energy that it makes to make sili silicon cells and modules. I think you're really overstating that number. Many papers in the industry and the literature show that it's much less than that. I personally made the calculations that showed it can be from one to four or five years. Even in Switzerland, the weather is still good enough. Well, can that. I answer this? Uh, <laughs> look, the, if we all agree on the five gigawatt per square meter, this is not my number. This comes out from Dr. Gopay's group. At the, the, he's, the, he's the silicon expert in Switzerland. He gives us that number, five gigajoules. It's actually the lowest bound. You count the electronic silicon as having zero energy content if you do that. If you start from the scratch, you go up to 11. So I'm just saying, five gigajoules, if we can agree on that, I, that's I, the silicon figure. I don't you know take the that. number in. The reason why you guys come up with smaller numbers, I can't tell you why. You say, well, that's electric power. We just, the Carnot factor is three, so you just take a factor of three out. You're down to, from 15 to five. Then you put it in the Sahara. It will give you another factor of three. You're down from five to one to 1.5. But the truth is, if you count energy as energy, the joules for a joule, that's what you get, 15 years on five gigajoules per square meter. Well, I still don't, uh, don't agree with that, but it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the last comment I had, uh, it was an interesting thing that you brought up for uh, hybrid vehicles. Uh, uh, a lot of papers were written on that, in fact. Uh, people uh, looked at the Prius and adding uh, 1.2 square meters of solar cells on the roof. And uh, ultimately, yes, it would be good to work with the, the automotive manufacturers to see if we can use that concept of uh, short distances only on electric. Unfortunately, Toyota does not agree with that, but thanks for Well, that's, uh, I don't think so. I think uh, mm -hmm. Toyota is very much interested in doing that. They just are very careful. They want to go. I have very good contacts to Toyota. As a matter of fact, one of our licenses is Toyota. I think it's a car company. And so they're just very careful. They market now the Prius. The Prius doesn't have the, the big uh, uh, 
battery capacity. That's so right. you would need a bigger battery, but they're working on this. Just yeah, give my, them time. My, That's the concept. My That's dealer didn't accept me to do this modification, so. Other questions? Yes. Have you done any, um, um, let's say, rough cost estimates of your cost per square meter that you could share with us? In, manuf in some manufacturing volume. Well, Bill had the, it was it one, one or dollar of the pig one? Yeah, I can, I can comment on that, Ken. Uh, we've obviously had to do a lot of uh, analysis for our investors uh, in advance of their investments uh, coming forward and uh, project the cost based on the materials content, um, short term and also our longer term roadmap. So we know that the ultimately the die cell in a roll-to-roll -roll plastic form, and then the polymer cell longer term, uh, all are producible well below a dollar per one. And you're assuming what efficiency there? Uh, that's assuming a 10 percent. So that'd be like hundred dollars a square meter. Yeah. Yeah. So that seems very reasonable for a thin film. Right. I think I think the other factor I just want to mention to everyone since it's Sunday. Uh, you know, everybody gets their Sunday paper and there's all those brilliantly printed uh, advertising sections in there that you promptly put in a pile and somebody throws away or use it in the birdcage. If you were to unroll or unfold all of those pieces of nicely color printed uh, paper and lay them out, measure that area, you get a sense of the kind of capacity that's available for high-speed printing. So high-speed printing could deliver in, and we have these kinds of newspapers available in every U.S. city and all over the world. You begin to see the multiplication factor that's possible with high volume roll-to-roll -roll printing and coding methods. Actually, we've assessed the complexity of the, uh, our printing process and coding processes relative to that. That's why we have a number of Polaroid scientists working for us who worked in those pilot plant areas. And uh, it's a very straightforward application of most of the high-speed printing and roll-to-roll -roll coding that exists really around the planet. So if we get the chemistry right uh, and the reliability of the interconnect and the, the product applications right, the deployment of this we think can build upon an existing worldwide infrastructure. So that's one of the motivations that why we've stayed with the plastic roll-to-roll -roll approach versus glass. That's the primary reason. Sure. I'm just wondering whether anybody has tested these materials with uh, high energy radiation, like protons or any, what I, is I its think impact? So. I think some cells have been sent up in this low air force contact in space. Okay. And it's, um, it's I, I'm, I'm not sure what the uh, results were, but you know, when your high energy radiation hits the oxide, you make electron hole pairs. And, the holes will be uh, react with the iodide, so there is a hole scavenger in the system that, that will take care of these holes. That's the most important thing to protect the uh, the cell from ox uh, from oxidative degradation, and so that's why you need a real fast uh, hole scavenger, or else you have to protect the film, the TI2, with some kind of overlayer to use core shell particles instead of just using plain TI2 particles. That's also a concept one can use to avoid UV damage. So but that high energy radiation is very similar to UV. It produces electron hole pairs in the, in the oxide. Will that reduce your conversion efficiency then? You mean how much in AM0? Mm -hmm. It's higher because we have, a, we have a blue disorder response. For us, going to AM1 is already an advantage because AM1 radiation is blue shifted from AM1.5. And so if you go to uh, AM0, you will get uh, additional uh, efficiency enhancement. Do you have a question? Uh, there have been uh, various efforts to replace the liquid electrolyte by, by a, a, a polymer or by a solid state. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly comment on the situation where we are? Yeah, that's a very important point. Uh, I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, well, the, for example, in the... Uh, Konaka cell, I don't want to give any <laughs> uh, specific uh, confidential information away, but uh, there's no liquid, uh, volatile liquid. These are based on ionic liquids. In other words, very nice uh, new area of research are ionic liquids. 
These are, these are salts that are liquid at room temperature, and they're liquid down to minus 100 degrees, some of those. So they, are not, they have no vapor pressure, and, and uh, those are the ones that are being used because uh, in the plastic cell, you're worried about the evaporation, uh, uh, evaporation through the, uh, through the uh, uh, membrane, and so you cannot use any organic solvents in those cells. And so fortunately, the ionic liquids reach a very similar efficiency to the solvent-based solar cells. There's been a very, very large amount of research, and in our own group, too, we have been holding, actually, efficiency records with ionic liquids. And so that has uh, helped very much. With the polymers and whole conductors, efficiencies are still low. They are like 4 or 5%. With the ionic liquids, they're close to 10 Yes. Could you say a little bit about the uh, organizational structure of the nanoparticles? Is, how sensitive is the efficiency to the kind of uh, second order of structure that forms, and what, what might be an optimum structure for that? I think what Nate said in his lecture is, uh, is very true. If they had a nano uh, rod, kind of a carpet structure, that would certainly be an optimal configuration. What we are dealing with here is very disordered. And the trouble with some of these, say you want to use a polymer as a whole conductor, like the folks do with the fullerene cell, well, you have to infiltrate that polymer in the porous network. And that's not so easy. You have the nanopores. And so uh, fortunately, with the ionic liquids, they do go in easily. But uh, it's, uh, so if you had this comb structure, that we all dream of and we're working on. Uh, that would be much better, I think, from the collection and uh, uh, transport point of view. So there's ways to improve that. It just, we are, what we did, we, we improved on the uh, crystallinity of the particles. We have nicely faceted nanocrystals now. But the, the, the shape is certainly not optimized at this stage. Yes. You talked a little bit about um, a multicolor cell. Could you talk a little bit more about that, given that the efficiency, every bit of efficiency you get without adding cost is so valuable? Well, in this case, we just had a tandem where we had a light absorber that was going out to 900 in the lower cell, and the upper cell was a, the red dye, so we, we matched the columns. In other words, the nice thing about the nanocrystalline film is that you can adjust the thickness and uh, to, to, get op to get the desired optical response. Mm -hmm. And so your top cell, you can design such that it delivers just the same current as the bottom cell. And if you do that, then you can uh, put them in series. Or if they have the same voltage, you can uh, put them in parallel. And so in this case, we had actually put them in parallel. And we were drawing 24 milliamps per square centimeter current at a voltage of about 750. It wasn't optimized, because the two cells did not have exactly the same voltage. And so that gave us a 12% efficiency. But where, where are you going from there? I mean, it's clear 12% that is better than 11, and 13 is better it, than 12. It's clear that uh, our goal is to get to the 15%, and uh, we are committed to that. And the tandem cell concept is certainly going to be of enormous help. So we are now developing near-infrared sensitizers that would go up to, say, 1,000 or 1,100. And that would buy you the additional current you need from that second bottom cell to get, to get say, to 28 milliamps. We would need about 28 milliamps on, from the two cells to get to 15% with our voltage changing nothing, just the absorber. With the norm with the normal redox system we are running now, you just need to have 14 milliamps per square centimeter each. And you can calculate above 600, the sun gives you 7 milliamps for each 100 nanometers. So you can just, on the back of the envelope, design your <laughs> ideal sensitizer for the bottom cell, and you know what, what, what you need. And then the folks that do the synthesis have to do the hard work and uh, Get the, get the absorbers. But you could also use on the bottom cell some, I don't know, Curtis or whatever you want to use as an absorber layer. Some nanocrystalline uh, 
uh, lead selenide. Or, I mean, it's, nothing prevents you from doing that. We have a question over here. Just a quick question. I, after your introduction, I was a little bit uncertain about how you quote your efficiency figures. Is this now s still AM 1.5, 25 degrees centigrade? Or is yes, it I just, uh, uh, yes, we are adhering to that convention. Okay. Although it's, for us, it's, uh, of course, not advantageous. Uh, we, have, uh, we have sometimes better efficiencies at 60 degrees. And so we would be better off if we could compare the silicon at 60 degrees. <laughs> Because 60 degrees, the silicon goes down. And so we would have uh, uh, the, the levels <laughs> would get very close. And 60 degrees happens to be the temperature where the cells work. And I, 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 don't, I don't know whether you know, but in, uh, there is a Fraunhofer Institute in, in Germany. They, they have a very, very strong group in photovoltaics in Europe. And they, they are our calibration lab. And, they have, they have done measurements, and this is all documented publications. And they, they are now advocating to use a realistic reporting condition and not the standard reporting condition. And a realistic reporting condition would be a good test at 60 degrees under full light, here's silicon cells. Then you put our cells next to them, you'll see how the <laughs> differential works out. But the truth is that out there in the, Real conditions, cells get warm. That's why we test at 85. Why do we have to do an 85 degree test over 1,000 hours? Because cells get warm. Yeah, I mean, we would have seen that effect of the temperature coefficient also in, by comparing crystalline silicon with amorphous silicon, which also has a lower temperature coefficient, or CIS. And we don't see that systematic impact because also you have the spectral dependence with one of the high band gap cells, you have a smaller spectral response, which also has an impact, probably a negative impact. Um, I can only say if you would put our cell next to silicon, I would have a net advantage. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. 60 degrees, I would have a net advantage because I don't have this penalty. Yeah, I, I was referring to uh, kilowatt hours in the field, kilowatt hours per kilowatt peak under standard test conditions. Yes, that's very important. And uh, just yesterday night, I got another email from, uh, from a near, uh, Middle East uh, potential client from Middle East. And he wanted to know what, uh, not what the standard efficiency was, but he said, well, we are at the 25th degree latitude. I have a typical exposure this way. How much kilowatt hours per, per year would your cell give per square meter? So uh, people getting wise, they, they think about now energy and not, and not power. So this, the, the, this, they think about how much energy will be delivered by the device over a over one year period. Now, I think we need to adjust to this because uh, the clients will be very unhappy if they discover. I have one case in Switzerland uh, where our local cantonal government, they bought 20 uh, kilowatt silicon and uh, on their, just the government building. It was the standard efficiency was uh, I don't know, 12% and didn't deliver the power. So the, the shareholders got very unhappy because they had to, to buy 20% more of the panels, which brought the cost up. And so let's just be honest and say under this normal reporting condition or standard, this is not really the final efficiency. You will get probably 20% less when you put them out there in the sun or in the, in the clouds. We have sometimes in Switzerland. <laughs> That's actually also a good thing to consider the clouds. And there's a lot of diffuse light. And so you be careful about the efficiency you will get then. Yes, can I, I think you're right, and I think that's happening naturally. As the markets go towards more power, I mean, uh, energy measurements rather than uh, earlier markets, which depended more on the peak power, then they're going to measure energy more. So uh, it's, it's happening. And also the second thing that's driving it is all these different technologies. When everything was silicon, then you were comparing silicon with silicon, and there were some differences, but it was slight. But with all the new thin films, you get some more variation, so you need to know kilowatt hours per kilowatt. So that really is the bottom line, and the way to do that is the only thing that's in question. I mean, so you're right. That will be done. Thanks, Ken. As I said, we are all friends, and there are lots of <laughs> opportunities, but we have to get the numbers. 
I'm, I'm not contesting a standard. It's just to how to this standard relates to real condition. One has to be honest about this. Absolutely. Any other questions? Yeah. I just want to comment on these uh, your colorful uh, solar cells. I think those are great for public awareness. Yesterday, one of the uh, issue was how do you bring the public awareness that the solar energy, I think this is a good marketing point of view and bring the awareness. And also the teenagers market is very huge. So I have seen some Japanese things wearing colored caps and colored umbrellas to charge up their cell phones. I think even if you save energy by some means, even with the low efficient cells, I think in term we save a lot of energy. So. Bill, what is the name of your marketing manager? Uh, Dan McGann. Mac Daniel McGann. McGann? Yeah. McGann wants more passion. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, we like the idea. We, we have uh, a suite of, uh, of colored cell technology that we're developing as part of this, so uh, we're pretty excited about that area of the market. And we get this comment from every architectural firm, every, everyone wants color. They want color capability. It's not that they hate the current colors. But it's the only one, and so that's why they sell chocolate and vanilla, you know? I mean, it's people want different uh, flavors, so uh, ultimately there is interest. And the, the example of the car company is a very important one. Um, even if you could put, um, you know, put the idea of a, of a, sun, a solar panel, I'm sorry, of a sunroof in your car that doesn't let light through is kind of a strange concept, right? But putting a glass solar panel in the ceiling of your car to generate electricity when it sits in the sun has tremendous traction with the uh, auto companies. And the reason is uh, the car gets hot when it sits in the sun. The solar panel generates electricity. You can run the fans and the uh, various passive uh, or active cooling and air flow through the vehicle, and uh, you don't run down the battery. So there's actually tremendous interest in this. Um, additionally, they'd like it to be cosmetically interesting, which means different colors. So just putting a, an opaque uh, glass panel in your roof doesn't, doesn't help that equation. So. Yeah, Volkswagen is probably the leader in that, but there's several that are uh, after that. Uh, one other quick question. In your iron rust example, was its efficiency cut down because you didn't have the right size nanoparticles and diffusion lengths, do you think? Uh, yes. Uh, iron oxide is... Uh, it's very nasty, notoriously. It's, uh, it has a very bad reputation because there have also been all sorts of claims made. And, and so tackling iron oxide is the ultimate challenge, which I can tackle at the end of my career. I don't <laughs> have anything to lose. <laughs> so uh, so uh, it's, uh, yes, it has a very, it has a short diffusion length. And we are still, we, have need, we need shorter features. But uh, it also has a, a relatively slow kinetics of water oxidation because the holes travel in the D-band of the iron and not in the oxygen T-band. And so that gives you an, an, an added problem. So you, would, you need some catalyst on the surface. You haven't done that yet, but ultimately we will need some catalyst. There are some uh, colloidal uh, iridium oxide or transparent uh, oxygen evolution catalyst. We need to put that on to, to to, to enhance the rate of water oxidation. One more quick last question. Just, uh, very quick, yeah. You are talking about alpha iron oxide or gamma iron, uh, iron oxide, which modification you are talking about? Well, yes, alpha hematite. What was the question? Yeah, which oxide were you talking about? Well, hematite, alpha. Hematite. Yes, alpha. Well, thank you. We're, we're adjusting the schedule somewhat. Um, lunch is at 12.30, so um, we're going to ask, uh, we've asked Alex Ignacia if, if he will speak in the morning, and he agreed. So we will finish up the morning with, with Alex Ignacia, who's speaking on the potential of new materials to advance the science of solar power. Good morning. Uh, 
I'm on, I guess, right. <coughs> uh, title's a little bit different, but, but, but I'll go from here anyhow. I think it's this, uh, this button here. Um, I'm going to change, uh, change directions a little bit. Well, not change directions. We've heard about uh, second generation, third generation, maybe 3.5 generation solar cells. I'm going back to 0 0.5 generation solar cells. Um, and, and the focus of this was really to, 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 to try to identify how we can use the space environment to give us electrical energy. Everything we've talked about today, uh, the last two days uses a space environment, uses radiation from the sun, uh, and converts that in some way or other. Um, uh, so uh, I, I want to focus that a little bit differently and look at it from the space side and then see how it can impact the terrestrial, the terrestrial view. Uh, those are the folks that did all the work. I'm just talking about it. Um, and the first thing in space, as well as terrestrially, what we want is we want electrical energy. Uh, that's, that's the driver, the principal driver, and principal driver for, for, for the world in the long term. We're talking about an extra 20 terawatts of energy, uh, sorry, of power uh, that we need down here in, say, the next, by, by 2030 or 2050. So that, these are the first three things that we need, both terrestrially and in space. We need electrical energy. Um, and in space, uh, we use it for exploration and for colonization, those kinds of things that are, are maybe part of the, the, the current vision and the future directions in terms of space policies, both here and, and, and elsewhere in the world. Um, terrestrially, uh, uh, this space impact is focused on, on, a, on a, a space solar power satellite. Uh, this is a concept that is not new. It was back in the 70s uh, and, uh, and most recently has been, been resurrected uh, in uh, the New Look study within NASA back about five or eight years ago. Um, and it, focused, it focuses on, on, on developing, fabricating, deploying a satellite or a series of satellites that, that, that in, uh, encircle the globe, uh, generate uh, 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 electricity using photovoltaics, and beam that electricity back to the Earth. Well, we already have a satellite there. It's the moon. Uh, and so uh, our focus is, is, is why not f utilize that satellite? There's no need to build uh, all the infrastructure, uh, only a little bit of the infrastructure. So let's use that satellite, a natural satellite, and, and, uh, and utilize uh, that environment to be able to generate electricity. Well, the moon is a solar power satellite. A number of folks have discussed that. Dave Criswell is here. Marty Hoffer has talked about things like this. Uh, I mean, Peter Glazer started the first concept of the solar power satellite, I think. Uh, but nonetheless, um, uh, how do we establish the moon now as a solar power satellite? <clears throat> Why? First of all, to use that energy on the moon. Uh, we will have a base on the moon uh, within my lifetime, I'm sure. Um, uh, and we'll be able to do other things there. But, but nonetheless, once you have that environment uh, established on the moon, uh, you can then use that lunar uh, in, uh, area uh, for, uh, for uh, generating a, a large in, uh, amounts of, of energy and beaming it back to the Earth. Uh, but we'll first focus on a small-scale lunar solar power system and then accelerate the technology to a larger scale, and that larger scale can then impact the terrestrial environment. So... For a small-scale uh, uh, lunar power system, we need something of the order of a megawatt, a few hundred kilowatts to megawatt for a lunar base. Uh, that's, uh, uh, with time, then it may go to a few hundred megawatts, and then with longer time, you can go to ter gigawatts and, and maybe even terawatts downstream. Currently, the, the perspective is non-nuclear, non-mechanical. Mechanical is a long-term problem for support in that environment. Nuclear is a political problem currently, but nuclear is also a large mass problem. And remember, when you talk about space, uh, mass is, is, uh, is, a, is a major uh, uh, detriment uh, to, uh, to uh, generating systems in a space environment, and, and nuclear has a large mass associated with it. Well, so let's focus then on solar cells, because we're going to not worry about uh, mechanical systems or nuclear, and the current technology is a few hundred watts per kilogram. Uh, and if you want to deploy, let's say, a megawatt of solar cells on the moon, uh, fabricate them here, and you want to do the highest quality to minimize the mass, etc. You're talking about a few billion dollars to install a megawatt on the moon, uh, and realize that most, a large fraction of that is, is is the launch cost. And you always have to incorporate that into anything uh, when you discuss the space environment and, and, and energy in space. But let's uh, let's look at the following scenario. We learned, uh, uh, you know, many many decades ago uh, on how to live off the land. And the pioneers, at least in the U.S., didn't take uh, their whole house with them. They took the tools they needed to make uh, what they uh, what what they uh, 
required in a new environment. They, in fact, brought their axe and their saw. They chopped the wood to build a house. They chopped the wood, used it for fuel. They chopped the wood, removed it, and planted plants in the, uh, in the field. So, so, so let's try to live off the land. And this is called in situ resource utilization. So in a space environment, let's not take everything with us and launch it there, because launch costs are significant. Let's take what we need in terms of tools to utilize that environment to make the devices and the, and the systems that we would like to generate energy. Let's look at the lunar uh, resources. Uh, number one, uh, let's realize that the, lun the moon has a very good vacuum environment. 10 to minus uh, 10 tor or better during the daytime. Actually, it's on 10 to minus 11 at night. Um, so we can focus on, on, with that vacuum environment, vacuum deposition. I'm an old vacuum guy from a long time ago, and so therefore, and I see a vacuum, I say, hey, I can make things in the vacuum environment. The other thing is that the moon has all the elements present that you need to make silicon solar cells. Maybe other solar cells also, but principally silicon, and I'll, I'll comment on that a little bit. It's got silicon, iron, titanium oxide, calcium, aluminum. They're all there. They're not there in a very nice chemical uh, uh, state, uh, but they are all there, in fact. Here they are. This turns out to be uh, Apollo 15. Uh, I can't see from this angle. Apollo 15 regolith data. There's ilmite, anorthite that are components of that. But you look at that, you've got silicon, titanium, aluminum, chromium, iron, magnesium, sodium, potassium, sulfur. There actually is a little bit of cadmium there. There's almost no tellurium there. But nonetheless, uh, I'll comment in a second. So it's there. All you have to do now is utilize those resources and extract that, 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 that material from the regolith. Why we started thinking about this a while ago was, in fact, uh, NASA had supported significant pro uh, projects in the past to try to extract oxygen from the regolith to support astronauts on the moon. You can do that chemically. Uh, you can process the regolith. Regolith really is just the lunar dust, mostly silicates and illuminates. You can process them to extract out oxygen. And when they were doing that, the waste products were silicon and iron and aluminum. Well, I don't look at them as waste products. They, in fact, are the building blocks that we want to do in terms of thin film technology. Uh, and there are a number of processes, that, therefore, that can extract silicon from the regolith. There are also a number of processes that can extract metals from the regolith. And now you're starting to put together the, the components of, of a silicon solar cell. So there's carbothermal reduction. You reduce with carbon. There's hydrogen reduction, fluorine reduction, electrochemical processes, electro, uh, electrolytic processes. Um, uh, and the question here then is to identify the best process you want for the lunar environment to be able to do that extraction of both the silicon and the metals and then utilize that as the initial components for your solar cell development. So we'll focus then on vacuum deposition because we have a vacuum environment there. I don't need a vacuum chamber. It's there. Thin film solar cells because of the deposition aspects of being able to deposit in a vacuum environment and then the utilization of lunar resources because we have the resources there, or at least a large fraction of the resources there that we need to be able to develop, say, a thin film silicon-based solar cell. So let's make solar cells on the moon. Uh, here's a, a typical example. No need to, to, to belabor this. But as all of us know, for thin film cells, a substrate is a, a major component in terms of mass. But we have to have all the components here, the substrate, the bottom electrode, the junction, <clears throat> top electrode anti-reflect layer, and you've got to in interconnect these cells individually in some way. So let's start on substrate, first of all. <clears throat> what we've developed in terms of substrate, realize that the lunar regolith, the lunar uh, dust, is very fine. It's 100 micron or smaller particles. Uh, they're uh, uh, silicates, illuminates. Um, and it turns out that it softens at around 1,300 degrees C. It's quite viscous, some gas evolution, but it melts around 1,500 degrees C. And when it melts, it forms a very nice glass. It's a lunar glass. Uh, it's uh, between, actually, between 2 and 10 megaohm centimeters is the resistivity. It's relatively smooth in terms of uh, the actual roughnesses of the order of uh, uh, 15 nanometers RMS. It's not really, uh, it's, it's not bad at all. It actually uh, d gives you a very nice glass substrate by using the regolith directly, just uh, simply melting it. So you need a little bit of energy to do that. Okay. So excellent solar cell substrate. Um, in fact, if you take the regolith and melt it, you also evaporate it. The, 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 the vapor pressure is high enough. When you evaporate it, you find it that it's mostly silicon dioxide that you're evaporating. And in fact, it makes a uh, relatively nice anti-reflective layer. 
So now we're using the components on the moon to make not only the uh, make a several com uh, uh, the regolith to make several components of the solar cell uh, directly uh, in the lunar environment. So here's the rest of the cell then. So we now have a regolith glass substrate. Uh, and then we need to add the back contact, the P and N junctions, and the top contact. And that we're going to end up doing then with respect to uh, uh, silicon uh, evaporation. Well, we tried to do some extraction of silicon from the regolith. It's carbothermal uh, reduction uh, using carbon, um, either, either as, as methane, as, as, um, as benzene, a variety of ways. And it turns out what you end up with is ferrous silicon. Uh, the driver for that it gives you ferrous silicon as far as you go, and therefore it's not a really good process, and we, we learned that a little bit early on. <clears throat> and so there are other ways of, of, of doing it, and currently we're looking at electrolytic reduction of the metal oxides. It's something that can be done uh, quite directly. It's, it's, it, it is being done uh, uh, commercially for a number of other applications. Uh, but in this case, you simply have a, uh, uh, an electrolyte. Uh, you have your, your, your molten oxide electrolyte. You have your the, uh, uh, the, 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 a metal alloy pool at the bottom of here, and you can't off the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, material that you, that you, re that you need in, in, this, in this environment. Uh, this is a little bit energy hungry, uh, and we have to keep that in mind, but this has the possibility, in fact, of giving us some relatively qual good quality material. You can do first an extractor and extract the silicon as a, ferris, as a, a ferrous silicate, then you come by and you do a refiner and refine it down to, to a silicon that would be adequate for, for use. Uh, this has been done in the past a while ago by Rudy Keller, uh, and in fact he generated some silicon from a silicon aluminum, al aluminum alloy, um, and we in fact took some of the silicon uh, actually, he, he uh, generated that from, from, from true lunar regolith. He got some, some lunar, lunar regolith from, uh, from NASA Johnson and, uh, and, and utilized that. And we got some of his material, and we did some evaporation. It turns out that, uh, that uh, the material, as, uh, as developed, uh, as extracted, was, had some uh, fairly large amount of, of impurities in it. But once you do the, th the thermal evaporation, uh, in the vacuum environment, you essentially vacuum purify the system, so you, you advance, advance its, 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 its purity as a result, making it hopefully uh, useful then as the silicon starting point for the uh, uh, thin film silicon solar cell process. So you extract the silicon in the metals. Uh, you, in this case, we'll bring the dopants. The, the dopants that you need, uh, you need in very small quantities and, and, and bringing that kind of mass to the moon for initially is probably a, a reasonable thing to do, at least in the bootstrap phase or at least the first uh, several uh, five, five year phase or so. Um, there, are, there, are, uh, there is a small amount of arsenic, uh, there's a small amount of phosphorus and you can use that for dopant. Of course there's a lot of aluminum so to do the PN junction would be quite direct, but initially you bring it with you. Then we fabricate thin film solar cells on the glass. So they're they're semi-microcrystalline, and we're shooting for still efficiencies that are low. Only a few percent, 5% would be, would be happy with. Uh, there's been some work done at the, uh, by CVD to show you can get about 8% in this case. But nonetheless, uh, we're going uh, to accept that as a, uh, as a, uh, a, a goal of the, of the order of 5 to 8%. I mentioned the silicon extraction, metal extraction by... by Electrochemical meals means is, is quite energy intensive, and so as a result, uh, initially, to bootstrap the process, you bring the raw materials with you to the moon. So when you bring them to the moon, then you're not necessarily restricted to silicon. And we're restricting ourselves to silicon currently because that's the largest, uh, 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 that's the uh, largest component, or one of the largest components in lunar regolith itself. So is there another system besides silicon that you can do thin film with? And we've heard that uh, um, many times uh, over the last couple of days. Sure there is. There is a, there's a number of them, and cat and cat sulfur is one of them, as an example. Uh, you can, uh, the, there are better candidates uh, for the following reasons. Lower temperature evaporation. You can do it at 600 degrees centigrade instead of uh, 12 or 1300 degrees centigrade. The direct, direct gap, we've heard that also. So thinner devices, you need to make less of the material. Um, uh, and therefore, lower power requirement requirements because of those, less energy and less time to do that, and use this to bootstrap the follow-on fa fabrication we're talking about no longer making a few hundred kilowatts or a megawatt worth, but now talking about make, making tens and hundreds of megawatts and maybe even gigawatts of, of, of solar cells on the moon. And so the initial concept then is you, you melt the regolith for a substrate, you initially bring the raw materials for the initial bootstrap semiconductor with you, and as I say, 
as an example, the CAD cell, CAD cell file system to bootstrap that power system on the moon. And, but now you need a deposition tool. So here comes the tool question. Remember, the, the pioneers had their axe. We need a little bit more sophisticated axe to, to do this. And so what we're developing then is the concept for a, for a mechanized, what we call a cell paver, something that's about 150 kilograms or so, uh, evaporate uh, the, the materials by using solar thermal. Um, that's there on the moon. It's present. Uh, we have some PV panels on there for motive or control power. This is a continuous layout of solar cells on the lunar surface, and you remotely control this. And this is an artist sketch. Actually, it's a sketch from, uh, from some architect uh, students that didn't put the shadowing in here properly. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you, you, you pave the cells directly on the surface of the moon. I said the regolith melts into a nice glass. And so you melt the regolith directly, you form your glass substrate, you deposit on that glass that substrate in a series of steps. And whether you do this as a continuous motion or a start-stop a stop motion is still up for discussion. Uh, and then you've got the thermal, solar thermal collectors to be able to do the, the energy needed for the evaporation process uh, and the small amount of the solar electric to give you the motive process uh, for the, uh, for the uh, cell paper itself. So I mentioned solar, solar concentrators to do the melting of the glass substrate. Um, turns out that a pair, about a one-meter parabolic concentrator will allow us to melt of the order of one to two millimeters worth of, of substrate over a strip that's about a meter wide by 10 centimeters long. So that's all you really require, a couple of millimeters of substrate. Uh, you can then actually, we've also looked at, so you can actually dope, dope that melted uh, substrate to give it some conductivity if you wish, or put down at the bottom electrode, either or, and you continuously form this glass bottom substrate as the cell paper moves along. Metallization, then you've got a top electrode <clears throat> um, uh, after you do this, the, the, the silicon growth. Uh, iron, actually we had al uh, uh, aluminum, we had iron in there, and it's, it's still not necessarily, that's clear whether we can't use iron. Iron is the most prevalent material extracted in terms of electrochemical means or carbothermal means, e either way. But nonetheless, <coughs> aluminum or maybe tisilicide is an example. Uh, anti-reflection coating, TiO2 is there. <coughs> Evaporated regolith, I showed you, could be a good uh, uh, anti-reflect coating. And then the cell interconnects and the cell bus bars. And for this case, things like iron could be used as a bus bar. Uh, a thick film bus bar to be able to interconnect all the cells uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and move the energy off from, from that environment. For the semiconductor, and for so the CAD tail uh, initially and the silicon later, solar concentrators with fiber optic connections. So you move your th solar, th solar, sorry, move your, th your solar energy to the environment where you want to dump it as thermal. Right? Line evaporators. Uh, we figure between a 10 and, and, and 100 micro, uh, microns per hour evaporation rates. Uh, that's about a meter per hour as a linear rate, and maybe two meters per hour, but in that, it's in that ballpark. So we're talking about something like uh, uh, tens to 100 uh, square meters per lunar day. I recall that's a 14-day, that's a, a but actually you get about 12 days' worth of, of time there. In the concentrator concept, is very direct. I mean, uh, 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 we heard that uh, the other day, uh, simply do the concentration, but you'll, you, you link that to a light pipe, uh, and the light pipe then focuses your energy wherever you want to put it. In this case, now we have a large number of small concentrators, actually, so this is now moving to the point where we're probably going to have about two dozen concentrators as, as a driver uh, for the solar thermal part. Why? Because this is multiple light pipes that get a nice uniform energy density over the, in the thermal region where you want to do the evaporation. Um, to melt the regolith, you do it in this following concept. Uh, you align up your, 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 your fiber bundles, you do some uh, radiation shielding, and you essentially can melt the regolith by, for instance, heating an intermediate plate uh, that then gives you some flattening and, some, and, and melting uh, directly in, in this manner. And, and this regolith will melt, as I said, around 1,300, 1,400 degrees, uh, degrees centigrade. Uh, we've done this experiment in the lab, and we can do that uh, with, with the solar concentrator actually relatively directly. 
uh, and you need of the order of 50 to 70 watts per square centimeter to melt at that regolith. That's why I say we, can, we have that possibility to do it there. In terms of the evaporation of the, of the elements downward onto this bottom electrode, uh, we've, we've developed this, uh, this line evaporator. Actually, it's a kind of an inverted evaporator, and we've tested this in the, uh, locally in the lab. Uh, again, it's, it's irradiated by the light pipes that gives you, gives you now a very nice uniform thermal uh, uh, irradiation of, along the length of the evaporator. And this evaporator can be of the order of, say, a meter long or maybe longer than that to give you a wide swath as you move uh, and or uh, de uh, deposit those uh, materials uh, on to the uh, substrate that's uh, at underneath of the, of the vehicle, the cell paper itself. Uh, you would interconnect these in a serial manner. Uh, you can interconnect them so serially. You can interconnect them also parallel. And here are the bus bars. And the bus bars uh, uh, can be iron. Um, the connectivity is not great, but it's there for, uh, essentially, it's there. It's, it's a product of the electrolytic reduction of the regolith to give, give you the silicon. And so you might as well use it as a metal. Uh, it's harder to extract the aluminum, but it's, it's doable also for aluminum. Uh, and these can be very thick bus bars. These, these, these can be bus bars that are, uh, that are uh, s s tens of centi or centimeters wide, tens of centimeters wide, and uh, tens of microns thick, enough to, ca to carry the current load that we're talking about. And we're only talking about moderate currents in terms of an individual uh, cell, cell grouping, so the initially of the order of, say, 5 amps at, at 100, wa 100 volts thereabouts. Um, and so f in terms of the fabrication of these cells, uh, Prototype facility, something like a meter per hour, a meter squared per hour. Uh, we assume 65 <coughs> watts per hour at 5% AM0. Uh, it, I think it's conservative, but I think it's, it's, it's also uh, quite, quite doable. And assume only a 35% uptime. Remember, we've got, uh, uh, this, this, is, this is over the period of the year. We have 14 day nights on the moon. Uh, and we also assume some time. 15% uh, of that, uh, that time then for, for maintenance, repair, whatever else is, is, is required, all the possibilities. No clouds to worry about, so we're not going to have that as a problem. And so this, is, this fabric is of the order of 200 kilowatt capacity per year. Uh, and it requires about 100 kilograms of raw materials uh, per year in terms of silicon to be able to do that. Uh, so uh, in the <clears throat> this is also a continuous process. And so uh, it's kind of a self-replicating system. Something goes wrong downstream, take that piece of a section offline and go make some more. I say it simply, but the answer is uh, you have the tool there to continue either repairing what you had a problem with or making more if you need to make more. And you also assume a limited lifetime. Uh, there will be radiation damage, there will be particle damage. Um, lunar dust may be a question, but probably not a significant one. Nonetheless, uh, with these uh, uh, kind of low efficiency cells to begin with, the, the decay rate is much lower than for high efficiency cells. Uh, and so the radiation damage will be there for sure, but it's not going to be as, as, uh, as, as critical uh, uh, a decrease in, 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 in efficiency percentage-wise as for high efficiency cell. Uh, but again, you assume the limited lifetime, and that simply means you assume that there for, for uh, the ability to make more cells as a function of time. Okay. Uh, so in terms of, so, so that's the cell paver concept, but we, we need to have the extract the materials from the, from the regolith for the long-term perspective, not necessarily for the, for the short term. Um, and that means we've got to do a regolith processing facility, a silicon, silicon metals extractor. That's between 100 and 150 kilograms. Uh, it'll scoop the regolith. It'll use the solar thermal, but also electric. And in fact, in the bootstrap concept, you go up there, you send the cell paver up first, It'll operate, say, for six months. It'll generate the capacity of the order of, say, 80 to 100 kilowatt capacity. Uh, and then you, you bring up the, the, this uh, silicon extractor, essentially plug the extension cord in. Not as simple as that. But utilize what you've generated there to be able to run this part of the process. Um, you recycle the electrolyte. You'll transfer the oxygen, because you do extract oxygen as part of this process. Use the oxygen elsewhere. Uh, and then you have to feed then the solar cell paver or pavers that are out there with the materials that you extract out from the regolith. And a 10 kilogram uh, a mass reactor will do about 150 kilograms of silicon per year, uh, and which is more than enough for one cell paver. So the size here is not, not critical as the reactor per se, but in terms of support equipment, you have to add some more mass to it, legs, support, etc. Um, you may also want to put together a small little rover to be able to feed the cell pavers from the mothership 
uh, uh, essentially to generate more, more materials. Uh, if, in fact, uh, uh, we have problems and we haven't th done the final configuration on this, uh, with final purity of the silicon, uh, we can do the vacuum purification. Uh, we've shown that this actually works uh, reasonably well uh, and can get us to the point where we believe we'll be able to do the 5% uh, cells uh, in that environment. And so here's an artist's sketch of the, of the extractor, and you've got the, uh, the, the main extractor here. You've got a refiner for silicon and maybe a refiner for, for, for metal that you want to uh, utilize from that environment. Uh, and there's a, a process flow for that. As I said, the initial extractor, extractor is here, excuse me. And then you go to refiner where you refine the silicon out. Uh, you also have uh, other things coming off of here, aluminum, titanium, iron, etc., that you can utilize in the process as part of the process flow. Uh, and for, uh, uh, to, to, for, for extracting out of the order of 150 kilograms per year, uh, the operation cost there is about 500 watts of power uh, to do that for a small model of the extractor itself. <clears throat> so in terms of the solar cells on the moon, we're going to use the, the ultra-vacuum environment or ultra-high vacuum environment to, 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 to do the, the deposition of thin film solar cells. Um, this really, for the space environment and for space utilization, this is a very cost-effective approach. Uh, the the, the, uh, the Less mass to the moon means we're, we're talking about for a megawatt system, which is, let's say, five years of operation of the, of the 150 kilogram uh, 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 cell paver and the 100 kilogram sil uh, silicon extractor. Uh, it's about one-tenth the cost of, of taking all of that, taking a kitchen sink with you to the moon and implanting it there. Um, we're using the lunar resources as a result, and there's also we're building in the trade-off of cell efficiency with, 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 with quantity. And the approach there is uh, the vacuum chamber is essentially free. Simply make more as a function of time. Uh, and that then focuses on a possibility of an industrial scale power generation. Uh, ten rovers of the small kind are talking about something like two to four megawatts per year. That's not uh, a, a large amount. 100 rovers of the order of 40 megawatts a year. Larger scale rovers, we're talking in, in the several hundred megawatts, in fact, to possibility of a gigawatt per year. Uh, and uh, uh, where do you use these? Well, first of all, in the lunar environment, there are a number of things that people would like to do in the long term. A lunar-based propellants, helium-3. Tourism actually is a, not a small object. Uh, astronomy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's also the, uh, the, uh, the poles of the moon where it's believed that there is at least, uh, if, not, if, if not water, at least a high concentration of hydrogen. Uh, both of those are important. And therefore, uh, you could, for instance, circumferentially cover a, a small mountain peak and get continual sunlight in that environment. There are, there are peaks of everlasting sun, or almost everlasting sun at the poles of the moon. Um, and uh, then there's the concept, this is, which is downstream, which is a, a picture that I, that I got from Dave Criswell, uh, where, in fact, you have your, your solar plant here on the moon. Uh, that's now beaming back to the Earth uh, uh, radiation, uh, sorry, beaming back to the Earth by, by microwaves or our radio frequency uh, uh, energy from the, from the moon. You put on two plants at the, at the limbs of the moon, so you, all, you always see the Earth all the time. Uh, you may have a, a, a superconducting transmission grid on the moon. Uh, in fact, the environment is, 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 is conducive to, 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 to doing something like that. Um, and so there's the possibility of, of having this natural satellite being our space uh, power, uh, solar power satellite. Um, we did a, a very simple cost analysis, and I, this, I, I, I stressed the simple part. We also did a very complex one, and I'll mention it in a second. But a simple cost analysis uh, at the, um, the, 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 the single cell paver and uh, silicon extractor model that I showed you for a three-year operation, uh, we're at something of the order of $11 per kilowatt hour, about $300 per watt. Which is uh, um, much, uh, which is low, much lower than than taking it there, even at the few hundred, uh, a few hundred kilowatts a level that we have here. Uh, this is I can't see the numbers from here very well, but if we go to the 10 gigawatt scenario, uh, we're talking in, in this, in, and there's a number of assumptions that are made here. Uh, we're in the few five to ten cents per per. per uh, Per, uh, uh, per kilowatt hour in that environment uh, in our simple analysis. And the simple analysis has to do with, with uh, uh, analysis whereby we, we look at a little bit of economies of scale, only a little bit, uh, but we don't use the, the traditional 
a model, which is there, the NAFCON model, which is an Air Force, NASA model for space, for space equipment. Uh, that gives 50 cents per kilowatt hour uh, at the gigawatt level. But that is a, a, a very, very uh, conservative model where, uh, where uh, we're talking about a, a, a significant cost investment in terms of the, the development of the, of the, trans, of the um, uh, facilities costs uh, in, that, in that model. Uh, so, uh, this is a broad brush uh, uh, look at, uh, at cost in this environment. Uh, and, and notice they're not small. We're talking about, you know, uh, uh, tens of billions of dollars uh, uh, to be able to, to do this kind of a, a, a project. But it also uh, generates of the order of uh, 10 gigawatts on the moon. This doesn't include the power beaming back. But power beaming, I mean, there are experts, uh, some experts here, I, uh, Marty can comment on it very, very easily. Although some of the numbers that I've seen recently is end-to-end is -end efficiencies of the order of 63% or so. Uh, I, I don't know if that, uh, that was last year, the uh, Japanese report that I saw. So, so the power beaming possibilities are there to do that. They're not incorporated in this. But this simply says we have the ability to use that satellite, the natural satellite of the Earth, to be able to generate significant uh, photovoltaic power capacity on, uh, on that satellite and beam it back to the Earth uh, for, for utilization here. Let me stop there. Thank you. Question. I'll let Marty go first because he's going to. I just want to say a few words about Mike. Uh, Mike. Mike, Mike, Mike. Microphone. <laughs> You can hear me, right? Yeah, I just want to say a few words about how this technology might uh, impact strategically on large-scale uh, solar power for the Earth for baseload. Um, the first thing is it's very important that no one is proposing a competition between terrestrial solar power and space solar power, even advocates like myself. Um, the important thing about space solar power, uh, which this technology of lunar fabrication w could be an important component of, is that, um, that the transmission and storage of renewable energy in general, solar energy in particular, is, is, is a major issue because of the intermittency problem and the, pro and the problem of matching supply and demand and turning on the lights at night. And so eventually, if one is interested in driving towards a planet where a major fraction of energy is derived renewably, a technology that could supply baseload power, uh, baseload electricity, it would be very valuable. And space solar power is that kind of a technology, and as such, it should be thought of as competitive with fusion, although unlike fusion, um, space solar power uses technologies that are all understood in terms of the basic physics, whereas fusion is still waiting for a critical plasma burning experiment, which is a basic physics experiment. Now, where lunar fabrication fits into all of this, how do we get there from here? There's a, probably a lot of interesting things you can do with lunar power bases, and NASA has just changed its mission to include uh, going back to the moon and going back to Mars, and, and at a relatively small scale, a lot of these technologies can be tested out. But I think we need to have an open mind, in, in uh, just as we should keep an open mind of centralized terrestrial solar versus putting collectors in the Sahara Desert, whether the, an ultimate space power system would be better to actually put the collectors on the surface of the moon, as my good friend Dave Criswell would like to do, or uh, perhaps to have uh, solar collectors, as Peter Glazer had envisioned them, in geostationary orbit around the Earth, but fabricate the PV cells on the moon. After all, the astronauts were able to leave the moon with a really small vehicle called the Lunar Excursion Module, you know, just peanuts compared to the huge Apollo vehicle that it needed to leave the Earth because the potential well is so small from the moon. And you can figure out that the launch energies per mass are very, very small for if you manufacture the PV cells on the moon and ship them to geostationary orbit for assembly versus manufacturing them 
at the surface of the Earth and bringing them up that huge potential well to geostationary orbit. And, and, and people are interested in those trade-offs. They, they've only become interesting, though, if you're really working on a massive scale where you have uh, many uh, hundreds of kilometers of PV cells in orbit, and we're very far from that. So I think what we need is we need some kind of an evolutionary plan where we can perhaps look at some early experiments in space solar power. And we're not talking about this at this particular conference, but uh, I do hope to develop some of those ideas at a conference at Stanford, which is going to happen right after this, and be happy to talk to anyone about this. And I've already talked enough. Thank you. Next question. I've got two questions. Oh, one is, if the idea is to get continual power, uh, then obviously the competition would be on uh, nanowire. So there's always some place on Earth that, the wa that there's sun, so therefore we have a cheap way of transmitting uh, electricity across the Earth, then we don't need this. And the question is, well, what are the, you know, if you look at uh, technological development, what's more likely, that we get nanowire or that we put, uh, s make solar panels on the moon? And my second question is a little bit more, maybe frivolous or maybe not, what would be the power density of the beam coming down, and what would happen if the beam wandered? The, the second one, the, the, the second one, actually, Marta can answer better than I can. But it was the order of uh, what, uh, 200 milliwatts per square centimeter, per square meter, right? Look, there are actually several designs. That oh. I'm just going to speak. You can. No, they can't. No, no, they can't. They can't. Okay. Okay. There, there are actually many designs. People argue about the best system for this. But I think everybody agrees that the beams should be low enough in power density that you could walk through them, that around the periphery of the beam, the microwave, if you're using microwaves, because some of these systems use lasers, that the beam intensity is within the OSHA health and safety limits for continuous exposure to microwaves. So you're not talking about a very high-powered beam. In, in most of the designs, birds can fly through them. You'd be exposed to less microwave energy than when you turn on a cell phone, and it's easy to show that, the, the, the watts per square meter from coming out of a cell phone that you have right against your ear would be comparable to, the, to this beam, and hundreds of mil, uh, at least 100 million people have cell phones. Given the litigious nature of our society, there would be mucho lawsuits if this was a real significant problem of low-level exposure to microwaves. Now, there are other ways of doing it. There are disadvantages of microwaves and advantages, and there's a whole community of people in the space solar power uh, business, which is not a huge business, but it's devoted. T's are pretty devoted, um, who want to do this with lasers instead of um, microwaves. And uh, there, there's a lot of concern that there might be, uh, it might be a potential weapon. In fact, some of the people who have proposed very interesting systems, like Lowell Wood of Livermore, are actually associated with the ballistic missile defense applications of lasers. Um, and so there's a very lively discussion about how to design such systems without uh, the perception or the reality that they might be used for nefarious means. But um, we can discuss this offline if you would like. Let, let, let me ask, answer your, or try to answer your first question then, okay? And, and not only nanowires, it could be superconduct, superconducting yeah. wires, et cetera, that, that would, would transmit the energy around the world. That, that's a full, this, a direct possibility. Uh, the focus here, though, is that, that we will be utilizing, we will be requiring energy in space, like it or not. We're going to be there. <clears throat> and so let's try to utilize the possibilities of, 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 of that aspect uh, to, 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 to add energy to the terrestrial environment from the space environment, clean for sure. Um, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the, the atmosphere, sorry, the non-atmosphere in the moon allows us to be able to, 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 to have a, a very a constant uh, supply there, except for, I guess uh, it was mentioned to me earlier that what happens in terms of a lunar eclipse, we've got to worry about that someday. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, 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 the, the, the supply there is, is, is going to be constant and, 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 and uniform. Uh, so there are some benefits there, the question always will become, uh, or will question will become downstream cost. Uh, 
question here and there. For the lunar application, yes. did you consider thermal electric systems and solar pump lasers just for the lunar application, not for the uh, beam into the Earth, as an alternative to photovoltaic? And in fact, I want to address this audience and then after hearing the advan advantages that were made with uh, um, polymer and, and other uh, organic materials, maybe uh, thermal electric is a viable option with the new materials. The, the, the challenge that, that we're faced with is, is, is the focus on utilizing the, the resources that are in space to the maximum possible extent. I don't see why thermal electric, okay. thermal electric materials is uh, just as uh, very similar, actually, to photovoltaic. Well, you don't mean uh, uh, thermophotovoltaics. No, no, thermal you electric. electric. I understand. Well, thin film thermoelectrics aren't, aren't, aren't really uh, 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 developed currently yet. Uh, so. It's true. Neither is this technology. Uh, I think no, you no, should no, look no, into no. But it. But I said this technology is, is, is 0 0.5 generation. This technology was developed uh, uh, 30, 40 years ago. Yes. Okay, so we've got to kind of resurrect that aspect of it. So um, uh, that's, the, that's the driver here. Uh, I think that uh, this uh, nanotechnology community should look into thermoelectric again. It's got some advantages, and it was discarded because of low efficiency. So we organic sort of thing. And uh, I see no physical okay. reason why it shouldn't be used. And it was actually developed for space application originally. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but, uh, there, there are, but, but thin film thermal, thermal, thermal I mean, and uh, One thermal more comment, thermal thermal. Uh, Marnie. I, I really don't understand. Definitely, if you, if you beam down from the moon, it's going to, the beam is going to vary. You, the, the, uh, the low efficiency microwave is going to uh, move, and you need collectors to collect it, and so you really, you're recollecting this energy, you're actually collecting it twice. You pay for the collection on the moon, and you pay for the collection on Earth. I, I okay, let me, let me try to make this argument as clearly as possible, because I, this is an argument which is generally, you know, it's, it's the first thing people ask, why, why go off the surface of the Earth? I mean, why go into space? The, go, the, fir, the main reason to go into space is because the average insulation at the surface of the Earth, long-term insulation, is about 0.2 watts per square meter. In space, it's about 1.4 watts per square meter. So there's about a factor of seven per unit area in the flux of energy. Now, that wouldn't do you any good, efficiency-wise, if you couldn't get the energy back from space to the Earth. So you need a way to transmit that energy wirelessly in, and, and the normal way is to do it in a focused, narrow electromagnetic beam as focused as you possibly can. The focusing of an electromagnetic beam is limited by physics because of the diffraction limit because any beam will spread by an angle lambda over d and so lambda is the wavelength. So the higher, uh, the, the shorter the wavelength, the less spreading and the smaller all the components can be. However, the atmosphere only is transparent in certain windows. There's a window in the microwave spectrum, that's why we have radio with telescopes that look through the atmosphere, and there's a window in the visible spectrum which is why we can see through the, through the atmosphere. The, the, the microwave spectrum has been explored and people have developed designs for microwave, phased array microwave antennas that can focus relatively narrow beams, but not narrower than is limited by diffraction through the atmosphere. That sizes, that their diffraction sizes the size of the transmitter and the size of the receiver. And in Peter Glazer's original idea back in the 1970s, you had like a one kilometer transmitter in space transmitting to a 10 by 15 kilometer receiver and it was huge and that had nothing to do with the power that only had to do with the refraction but if you're going to build such big components you have to put a lot of power through it otherwise it's not it doesn't it's not cost effective that that's one of the reasons people are looking at lasers as far as the beam wandering people have mentioned that a few times that is really not a major issue because there's a, a retro beam there's a beam that a pilot beam from the receiver to the transmitter, and if the beam wanders, either because of the physical movement of the transmitter or the 
phase the ray can't keep it stably focused, um, it just defocuses the beam so that it doesn't do any harm. You have to build that carefully and redundantly, but um, it's amazing how accurately you can do pointing and tracking. There have been some experiments with uh, lasers firing through telescope optics in Hawaii where at, at reflecting mirrors in satellites and then bouncing them back to the Earth while the satellites moved across the sky and that have been able to keep the spot focused on another receiver, a laser receiver, just a few hundred kilometers away from the transmitter. So that technology is believed to be pretty well in hand. I don't know if I answered your question, well, but... Well, I think it's yeah. wanting to ask, and I think Nate does want to ask. Well, at the risk of stretching this in a different um, area entirely, I'll take that risk. Um, if you want to launch a minimum mass to produce energy, the other option, and other option that comes to mind is, have you considered if you launched below critical mass of fissionable material and built an unshielded reactor? Um, uh, the trade-offs between the energy cost to do that and the energy cost to do this, and we have nowhere else to put our waste, you know, might as well put the whole thing on the moon and beam back the energy. The, the, yeah, and, and the challenge then is that, that in fact, uh, with respect to utilization of space, uh, there will be, they're expected to be manned there, and so, so the unshielded part becomes problematic. Oh, there are men here too, I mean. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, I thought I mean, men sure. here too. Or men, but not necessarily men. I see a hand up, but I did call him Mike for that afternoon. No? Okay. Michael? No? I think Mike was first. No, no, Mike. No, no. He, he, he answered my question. Oh, okay. I just wanted to, to with, with regards to Jacob's remarks, I think that, uh, Marty, were you telling us you want terawatts back to the Earth, and it's going to be so dilute that even my phone never wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do more harm, but that's going to require a huge collector then. I mean, you can't get terawatts. <laughs> You need the well, I have to, I have to answer collector. that. Yeah, you're, you're right. The question is, what's the footprint of a rectenna on the Earth? I mean, we've looked at this. A lot of people have. What's the footprint of a rectenna, which would be the receiver of these microwave beams, compared to a PV cell that would produce the same average amount of energy? And the, the, the rectenna would actually have a smaller footprint, even though the intensity of, 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 of microwave radiation in the rectenna beam would actually be somewhat less than full sun. Full sun is 1,000 watts per meter squared, whereas these beams are designed for an average of about 250 watts per meter squared. But you have to bear in mind that the beams and the microwave beams are always shining and the sun is not always shining, so the annual average value might be somewhere similar. Uh, plus the risk conversion efficiency, let's not forget that. We've got a PV conversion efficiency of something like 15 or 20 percent you know, very optimistic maybe with thin films, whereas the rectennas, uh, you know, are up around 90% in terms of their ability to convert microwave radiation into DC. And that also affects the relative footprint. And that's one of the reasons I think this is a great technology to test in tropical developing countries by putting an equatorial satellite in orbit into because I think land use becomes an issue in some of these areas, but I, I don't know if I answered that. Excuse me, uh, you already converted it to PV, uh, DC, so yeah. uh, we, uh, don't forget we already have done it on the moon. Yeah. So you don't need to convert it again, that's the only thing you're saying. We still have the whole department of converting well, the first time. You have to convert time. it again to, 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 uh, to beam it, you, you know, if you want to beam it through, you know, in a tight beam, you have to convert it either to microwaves or to, or to light. So it's going, there's, the question you want is what is the DC to DC transmission efficiency? And that transmission efficiency has been measured for Earth to Earth transmissions back in the 70s. It was done at JPL as a being about something like 60%. And that was over a distance of about a mile. Uh, if you want to get into this discussion, we have actually proposed doing experiments using existing uh, radars and radio astronomy facilities beaming into the atmosphere over hundreds of kilometers to see if we can get comparable efficiencies, or well, theoretically you can, but we really would like to take this technology to the next step and do some experiments and try to do it inexpensively and 
we think that's worth doing. But of course, it's true. You already have DC. But remember that factor of seven. Okay, on the moon, you have about half of that because the lunar day is half the time. Yeah. So. We have time for about one more question. On this topic, you ought to let David Criswell talk. Oh, He's the world's expert on this one. First, I want to thank Alex for a very interesting presentation, some of which I haven't seen quite impressed with. Thank you. Uh, I think the purpose of everybody in this room is to use what resources we can lay our hands on or invent to provide affordable commercial power to help raise the prosperity level of this planet and provide us with new freedoms that come from that. And there's at least two billion people on the planet now who are in desperate need of those freedoms. They have no commercial power. They live off the dredges of the biosphere. As you look at the, you know, if you look at the planet right now, we use 14 terawatts of commercial thermal power. That's equivalent to about four and a half terawatts of electric power globally. The moon is sitting out there dependably receiving 13,000 terawatts of solar power with no atmosphere, with no water. All of the things that you actually fight against very deeply and aggressively in, the pro in what I've hear heard today and for the last 30 years, those factors are absent on the moon. And so it brings in the possibility of making extraordinarily thin films by a printing process or on glasses or whatever and laying them out very quickly on the two limbs of the moon and getting a very, you know, 1% of the moon would be enough power to have prosperity on Earth. So we're really not talking about one technology versus another. We're just looking at what are the resources that we've got. And we've got that natural body up there, which has these interesting characteristics. As far as coming back to Earth, you've come back, at least in the reference models, have been looked at since the 70s, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with an output, a load following output of about 200 watts per square meter. That beam is coming in at 20% of the intensity of sunlight. It's very isolated for a world that uses the equivalent of six kilowatts thermal per person or two kilowatts electric per person equivalent. That's about 20 terawatts of electric power. It'd take about 100,000 square kilometers of receiver area split into receivers distributed around the major power users. These could be integrated over industrial facilities so you plug into the microwave receiver right above your head. Thing can be electrically or uh, from an energy standpoint, from a heat balance standpoint, can be completely neutralized at the 20 terawatt level. Uh, there's a new encyclopedia out from Elsevier called the uh, Encyclopedia of Energy. It's about 3,500 pages, uh, six volumes. I've got a few reprints of my short article, overview article from uh, section three or from volume three of that, which I'd be happy to provide anybody here. If I run out, give me a business card and I can send you a purloined copy of it. And it's uh, just a very high level review of this. But we have some very, very interesting uh, possibilities through this. One of which is in principle, extraordinarily uh, inexpensive energy. If you go through the whole daisy chain, the start that you're worrying about from the sun all the way down to bus bar or electric plug output. Uh, this can be, I think, at large scale, larger than what Alex is talking about, uh, less than a cent a kilowatt electric hour. So a lot of hard technical questions. Uh, you've got to get down and do the numbers. And at least I, the ones that I've done indicate that you can come down to these very low costs. And it's basically because you're dealing with thin films in the appropriate environment, both on the moon relay satellites in orbit and uh, essentially chicken wire like uh, receivers on Earth that operate under very, very low stress and can be quite tough, have long lifetimes. Thank you. Uh, we have some announcements by Amy and then we'll adjourn from up for lunch. Great. Well, we've had an exciting morning and our technicians are working diligently to see if they can get Larry Kuzmersky slides converted to a way that they'll run on the internet so uh, we can all watch it again. Um, I, um, you have on your table, and, uh, which we need you to sign, which is a release form um, so we can post your PowerPoint slides right away up on the web.
Um, I'm, I, I've learned in this business where you're all from different cities, sign it right now and pass it forward down to Wade um, before we go to lunch, and then we won't have to chase you down for it. Um, you also have in your packets from the hotel forms if we decide to post the whole video up on the web. And uh, we'll email you guys to uh, try to remind you to send those forms back with your receipts from extra travel. Um, we're, the afternoon program, we're going to have uh, Art Nozick's talk, and then we're going to add a talk from our own Howard Schmidt, uh, who is going to talk about the armchair quantum wire project at uh, our Carbon Nano Center laboratory. Uh, we just want to give you a little teaser so when we invite you back to the session on the electricity grid, uh, you'll, uh, you'll feel enthusiastic when you hear what he